Welcome to The Long Leash. I'm James Jacobson. Today, we travel to London to speak with Barry Karakostas, who has been transforming the way that Londoners care for their dogs for years. First, with an innovative dog walking service where Barry would run with up to 20 dogs off leash through the city parks. He became known as the dog jogger and garnered a certain reputation and a lot of tabloid publicity because a number of celebrities entrusted their dogs to Barry and his pampering dog fitness and wellness service. More recently, Barry has upgraded the available services that he provides to London's most picky dog-loving clientele. This upgrade comes in the form of a five-star posh dog hotel and daycare club with a simple mission of making city dogs happy and healthy so that they can make their urban pet parents feel the same way. This attention to detail and raising the bar and what others were doing probably started with Barry's previous career as a restaurateur. Now, many years ago, as you may know, London had a pretty dismal reputation when it came to food. However, in more recent times, London has radically changed all that and is now recognized as one of the most innovative culinary cities in the world. And so it is here, with food, that I began my conversation with Barry Karakostas. The culinary industry is top of the game. They have to be. You know, it's demanded, unfortunately. You know, when you set a bar, you know, we've got some great chefs, one that's, you know, conquered America, Gordon Ramsay. Um, you know, they set a bar and then, you know, everybody's got to meet that bar if they want to, you know, you know, be contenders. So I think it's it's in constant competition and that drives because that's what I was in. That was what I was involved with um, years and years ago. I came from a family of restaurateurs, and um, so I was a restaurateur myself. I had a restaurant in London, so I know the industry very well. How long were you in that? Well, ever since I was 16. I mean, I left school and, you know, I went straight into the business, and then I, I you know, I worked in it until, you know, my, my early 30s. And how did that prepare you for what you're doing today? <laughs> I don't think it was a preparation. I think it was more of a, a a downfall. You know, it didn't suit my my character very well. So I was, you know, drinking too much. I had, you know, I had a, a huge problem with drugs. Um, I wasn't sleeping, and you know, it took a, a really bad knock on effect. And it was my wife, I have to always mention her first, and my dog, uh, Leo the Rottweiler, um, that guided me through and out of a very deep hole. And I, you know, managed to turn my life around. So the underlining commitment to dog is very, very real and very strong um, because they saved my life and my family. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a family if it wasn't for, for the dog. Well, let's talk a little bit about Leo. How did, how did Leo play that pivotal role for you? Well, I think the responsibility as a couple, you know, we were, you know, myself and Julie, um, you know, as a couple, we were, you know, I was always at work. Um, she was always the one that looked after the dog. So when, you know, things hit the fan and things weren't going well, it was, you know, you clearly if I'm still around you're not helping yourself and you need to help yourself and get yourself out of the hole so she decided to you know what I'm giving you six months I'm going I've you know I've had it and you look after Leo he's your dog as well you need to you know show responsibility Mm -hmm. and you know the five o'clock in the morning stopped happening which inevitably stopped a lot of you know um, interactions social interactions I had um, and I had a, you know, an element of responsibility. I needed to go home. I needed to walk him in the morning, walk him at lunchtime, walk him in the evening. Um, so things were driving me back home. Whereas before, I didn't have the need to go home because everything was looked after. That's an inspiring story. It's great to hear how Leo helped you turn things around. Now, I think it's about then that you acquired a dog walking business, right? Let's talk about that. I was in Kensington Gardens and uh, there was an individual there that approached me. He had a business and he was moving away and he he said, you know, I see you in the park. Are you doing anything at the moment? I said, no, you know, I sold a business, which was my then restaurant. um, And I'm, you know, just trying to find a different path, you know. So he goes to me, well, I'm still in my business. 
how about you buy a dog walking business? And I was like, well, okay, how much? And he gave me a price. I said, now you must be joking. I said to him, I've got half of that under the bed. If you want it, come and get it. And he goes, no chance because, you know, we've got great clients and, and, and whatever. And I said, but yeah, but those clients are loyal to you. So it was a bit of to in and fro But then I, I think a couple of months later, he came up to me and he goes to me, you know that half you said? You, you go? I said, yeah. He goes to me, well, I'll take it. And I said, well, that half's now become a quarter of the amount. <laughs> so you could take it or leave. He goes, do you know what? I'll, I'll take it. You know, let, let's do this. So, so that was the beginning. So what was it like running the business? Tell me about how you worked with these dogs. I've always done everything excessively and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes it's in to my downfalls, but also to my ups. So I always give my everything and everything that I do. So even dog walking had to be, I had to be the best. I had to do something that, you know, excelled from everything that was, that was out there. Um, so I started running with Leo before I was going to see clients. And then I thought, uh, you know, these dogs are still going home and they've got barrels of energy. So I started reading about, you know, different, you know, engagements, both mentally and physically to drain energy of dogs so they could become easier to train. And, you know, running as a pack was one of them. Instead of running with just Leo, I started integrating some of the dogs that I felt that needed more exercise and more stimulus. And, you know, it was, you know, it was the evidence, the proof is in the pudding, as we say here. You know, you could see the difference. The dogs were amazing. Um, I had the knack, so I gradually increased my pack, and I went from you know three dogs to the you know at the at the top end of the time when I was doing it. It was you know I was running with a pack of twenty twenty one dogs. Were they all on leash or no? No, off lead. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and is that a problem in London? It's it is now um, because obviously the public parks are a lot busier. The population of dog are a lot more, so there are regulations now. But obviously, um, you know, there were certain parks that would allow it. The bigger parks in London. So I used to run religiously in uh, on Hampstead Heath, which I'm sure you've heard, and it was easy there because you could go off the beaten track, which was the exercise. It's a lot better for dogs to be on soft compound anyway. It's better for their ligaments, better for their muscle tone, better for their paws. Um, so we weren't really seeing a lot of other users, park users, and especially, you know, my exercises were, were very early in the morning. So my I used to pick up my, my first dog was at, you know, quarter past five. And, wow. you know, by 7, 7.30, I was already in the park ready to, to start the exercise. Um, so you would pick them up, you, you would drive around, pick up all the... That's it, all the dogs. And then, mm-hmm. you know, so I had a custom built van and, you know, head up to Hampstead Heath and then, you know, we'd give them a little bit of time. So the exercise was always 15 minutes in the beginning, you know, sort yourselves out in the pecking order. Of course, I was the boss, but, you know, it was, it was all about them to sort themselves out and also, you know, go to the toilet because once you get going, you don't stop. And they, they do <laughs> learn that really quick when they see the, the pack There's disappearing. There's no stopping the... Uh, when they when they do stop and you know especially the the, the guys that are you know not used to the uh, the exercise and they see the pack disappearing into the distance the fear and the the urgency to get back to the pack is so quick um but yeah <laughs> and it was refining that and i got healthier i saw my dog was getting healthier the clients were you know so the, leo would go with you on, absolutely on, he, was, he was he was there he'd sit in the front of the van with me we'd go around picking up dogs he was my he was my wingman. I love that. Had you been a jogger before you started this? Is no, this you I mean I was to? no, not at all. I was a I was a gym goer, so I was you know lifting weights and you know cardio mm-hmm. was never really um, my forte. I played a bit of rugby when I was a kid, um, but nothing. No running wasn't really an exercise. That, you know, it was dogs that got me into it, and you know I would do. A lot of, yeah, there's been a lot of articles and newspaper, you know, newspapers that say that I run miles and miles, some of them even a half a marathon every day. Um, but no, it was it was an exercise between Don't six, believe what you read, especially in the tabloids. Absolutely. But, you know, don't, don't expect them to write what you tell them in the tabloids, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, they were, you know, I would do six to eight kilometers and we would track the dogs with GPS and because they don't run in a straight line. They would they would clock anything between twenty to thirty kilometers on a six to eight 
my, so you put my GPS on each dog. So we did in the end, yeah. When the, when they start, when they exit, you know. Brilliant. I mean, I started it before the GPS, um, right. <clears throat> but when it came about, I was curious to see how many kilometers the dogs were actually doing because they don't run in a straight line, you know. So it's it's very different for a dog. So some of these dogs were doing thirty k, you know, thirty kilometers in a session. Did you ever, did a dog ever, you know, go far from the pack that you thought, I think he may be in trouble, he's lost? No, they generally, so there's a, um, there's a way that you do it and it's, you know, through the experience and reading and introducing dogs into a pack and the exercise. Um, so I would, they would be attached to me for the first, you know, seven to 10 days. They had to learn that they weren't allowed to cross my legs. So it obviously keeps me safe and obviously them because, you know, they don't, you, you know, you don't want a, a 15 stone bloke, you know, over a, a Jack Russell or a, a Vishla, you know, that can be very, very um, painful for them and also me. Mm -hmm. uh, also an integration into the back, into the pack because I'm introducing them. So they, they, you know, the other pack members get that confidence from me that this dog's okay, we need to accept him into the pack or her into the pack. And there was a process, you know, and it's only learnt through practice. Um, and that knowledge is gained by, you know, the exercise and working things out um, as and when you do it. So it's not really something you can read about. I mean, I've done... You know, I've, I've given my heart, so I've read about everything there is to read about, you know, mental stimulation, physical stimulation, you know, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, I think practice is uh, key to, you know, the experience. What kind of reactions were you getting as you were, as you had this large pack running through the park? Oh, people loved seeing it because they couldn't believe that the dogs were staying with me. I mean, if I ran off a cliff, they'd run with me. You know, and it was, it was, you know, it's hugely empowering and, and, you know, I felt proud of them. They felt, they felt great. So at the end of the exercise, we would sit down and literally they would just all just naturally sit around me. And it was, you know, it hugely empowering to me um, and so satisfying and soul, soul satisfying that, you know, I could actually give back to this wonderful species that saved my life, you know. What what were the comments from the clientele? What, what, what were they saying? That, they loved had the, it. Had their dogs changed? Absolutely. Dogs were losing weight. They were fitter. They had better appetites. They were easier to train. Um, on the days that I would run with them, they were they were you know impeccably behaved when they were taken to the swanky, you know Kensington cafes and you know so it it, it was very very clear that the exercise was beneficial to everyone. And also support. So, you know, I had boot camps um, for dogs that were clinically obese. And I'd work closely with vets, and I still do, um, putting them on diets and, and making sure that we're exercising them at the right rates and getting them as fit as they could possibly be, no matter, you know, what kind of breed. It could be a pug that did interval training, because obviously a pug is not going to run for six to eight kilometers, but they can do little bursts and stair climbs and, you know, just the same as a, a human would do. And again, owners would be, they couldn't believe their eyes when they actually got that dog back that they originally had, because it's... It happens and, you know, I've done it. I'm sure everybody who's had a dog has done it. We we feed through love. Oh, I'll just give him a little bit. Oh, I'll just give him a little bit and plus give him the food. And, uh, okay. and because they live with us, we don't see them piling on the pounds. Mm -hmm. And normally people are a little bit embarrassed. Oh, you've actually, you know, your dog's actually really put on a lot of weight. It's like you yeah. might want to stop feeding it. So I had to overcome that as well. Don't be so polite and actually become the voice of the dog. You know what? If your dog could talk, it'd be screaming and saying, my knees hurt, my paws hurt, I can't breathe properly, I don't really want to go for a walk, you know, I feel uncomfortable, I constantly want to do a poo, <laughs> you know, it's all those, you know, things. So I think they need a voice as well. So it's, you know, my, I felt it my job, if I met, it didn't matter if somebody took it the wrong way, I'd say it very tactfully. Um, but I would tell you, if your dog was clinically obese, I would tell you then and there. And it was. And these are death. client dogs or just dogs that you would observe? 
You wouldn't come up to someone on the street and say, no, no, God, I'm not that. No, 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 no. no. (laughs) We're talking about people that came to me for help or, you know, some sort of uh, service. And was, so you were sort of, you described yourself as a voice for the dogs. Elaborate on that. I'm, I'm intrigued with that. Well, I think they, they can't actually talk. So I think it's in it's in our duty as carers, whatever you're doing, whether you're a dog walker, a groomer, a, you know, you need to be, you need to state facts that, um, that go alongside animal welfare. And I think animal welfare is key. So the industry itself needs to have an underlining um, commitment to the animal welfare and it's not all always about money it's it's about making sure the dogs are happy and healthy and they can succeed in an urban environment for me because i live in an urban you know in an urban environment um and make sure that we're actually doing them justice and giving the right advice to support them in their way so they can be happy and healthy dogs Let's talk a little bit about that urban environment, and we will get into urban mutts in a, in a moment. Yeah. But I, the, you have, I, I've done, I do my background research, and and you've said that the dogs who are live in the city are different than dogs who live in the country. Absolutely, absolutely, they have to conform to a lot of restrictions, and they have a different consistency to succeed. Um, living in an urban environment dogs in the countryside are very different because maybe you know they they live on a big estate um, they probably see a handful of dogs every week whereas here in in an urban environment you'll take your dog to the you know the park or kensington gardens or high park he might see 500 dogs on a two-hour walk it's you know the population is big so you know of of course a dog has to have a different etiquette that lives in the city to the dog that lives in the countryside and is that an etiquette that they pick up on their own or is that something that is taught i think it's taught it has to be because you know you're constantly if you live in a you know in, in an apartment or if you live in a small house um, you're having to uh, commute to work or commute everywhere, then your dog is having to learn how to get on and off a bus on the tube, um, you know, on the underground, on the subway, as you call it, um, or go to a park where there's going to be scooters, skateboarders, uh, police sirens, helicopters, uh, swans, deer, you know, you've got all sorts being thrown at them all the time. So it's the duty of the owners to make sure that they're desensitized to these these by socializing them well, getting the right advice and introducing them to the different elements correctly so they can be happy and, and healthy and not nervous, anxious, you know, shying away or, you know, trying to protect themselves through through aggression. You are well traveled. Are 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 uh, London dogs different than I don't know New York dogs? LA, uh, dogs? LA. I mean, I mean, LA is definitely they pamper their dogs completely. I mean, they 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 do love their dogs, um, but I think we, in a way, probably treat our dogs more um, as family members. Um, Unlike the, I think in America, it's more like, you know, can you look after my dog? They'll go, yes. They're not interested what goes on behind the scenes. Whereas in, in London, I think they're, 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 they want to see everything. And they want, you know, especially now, um, the responsible ownership thing is, is huge now. There's a, a big amount of awareness where you're purchasing puppies from, et cetera, et cetera. So that, I think people are now more picky about where they send their dogs and more um you know put put pressure on finding out exactly what's going on with my you know with their dogs whether it be you know putting a fitbit on their on their collar making sure that they are going for a walk when they're at daycare um to you know cctv and i know uh, in america you know i've i've done a lot of research in America and the daycares do have live CCTV cameras and in the beds and, you know, in their, in their sleeping areas, et cetera, et cetera, um, that, that clients can tap into. I, I preferred and my business partner, Greg as well. We, we both came to the conclusion. No, actually you're not going to tap into a camera that's, that's marked up. 
come and see the facility because do you know what we've got windows everywhere there is no place in this in this facility that we've got um glory the, the wonderful urban mutts that you can't see you know you can walk in as a guest and be able to see the work you know the the staff the the mutt squad working and training and you know uh, giving the dogs a, a physical massage you can see it from from reception so there's no hidden uh, corner anywhere. there's no back room the mysterious there's back room like in a nothing, veterinary clinic no, that's it <laughs> there's nothing all right let's take a quick break here and we'll hear from our sponsors we'll be right back Hi, it's me again, James Jacobson, and there are three things that you should know about me. One, since 2003, I have been driven by an all-consuming mission. That mission is to help improve the quality of life for dogs and the people who love them. Two, I have founded or helped to co-found several companies that share that mission, including Dog Podcast Network. And three, every day, I give my dogs Everpup the ultimate daily dog supplement made by Functional Nutriments, which is one of those companies. What is Everpup? Everpup is an extraordinary all-in-one supplement that you sprinkle on your dog's food. It's a polyceutical, which means it contains an incredible blend of lots of different human-grade ingredients. It contains vitamins and minerals and prebiotics and probiotics and enzymes and dietary apoptogens and so much more. What you need to know is that it supports every cell and system in your dog's body. And Everpup is appropriate no matter what type of diet you feed your dog, from kibble to raw food to home cooked. And the rich green powder is easy to add to food. Dogs love the taste, they find it delicious. And you can even try it yourself because Everpup is made with 100% human grade ingredients. It's made here in the USA in an FDA registered and inspected laboratory. And all the ingredients are ethically sourced and triple checked for quality. Seeing is believing. So try Everpup for a month and see what happens with your dog. Everpup is available through select veterinarians and pet shops and Amazon. But here is the best way to try Everpup. Join the Everpup club and get free shipping to any U.S. address. As a listener to this podcast, you can get your first shipment of Everpup for just $8, including free shipping, when you use the discount code DOGEDITION. For all the details, go to everpupclub.com and try your first full jar of Everpup for just $8. That's everpupclub.com. And we're back with Barry Caracostas. Barry you run Urban Mutts, which I think has been described as a five-star hotel for dogs, a little bit like a Soho house. That's is, the one. Is that right? Yeah, that is true. Yeah. So we built this uh, from the ground up uh, with the animal welfare um, at heart. So even the flooring is antimicrobial. It's easy to clean. It's hospital grade. We have air filters. Um, that take pure air and it runs through so it, it, it sucks the air from the facility and it goes through hospital grade filtering systems so it stops any transmission of any disease that might you know be in the air or you know could be carried by one of the dogs um, everything we don't have sharp edges the, the the paint on the walls is non-toxic so even if a dog was to chew the corner of a wall off nothing would happen to him um, other than a bit of an upset tummy so yeah, so although five star, let's remember it's five star for the dogs and it's a five star location for dogs. Um, so well, well, let's talk about the location for those who are not familiar with, uh, with London, Des describe mm. where you are and, and what the amenities are. If I was, if I was Fifi and I was a, an urban dog, uh, needing a little, a, a little R and R because my uh, parent is away what would i as fifi experience oh I, wow well I, you yeah. would you would get dropped off into a, a nice reception there's a, a little bit of a, a retail department so you could go for a little wander by the time we check you in you can have a little wander around the shop see if there's anything that you fancy your owner to pick up for you um next to the reception is a big windowed uh spa where you can get uh, a hydro bath with some amazing products by uh, a great company called uh, Wild for Dogs, which is planet friendly and pet friendly. 
And the hydro baths are nice and gentle. We have quiet dryers, so they're easy on the ears for the dogs. We also got muffler, mufflers for the for the dogs. So it's actually, a, uh, and we don't rush. So it's not about, you know, getting them in and out. It's about, you know, we've got blueberry facials for the dogs that are, you know, want to get I'm sorry, rid of what? blueberry facials. <laughs> actually serves a purpose so it's predominantly for these dogs that get very very teary um uh, and they have sta- tear stains so they get a nice little face well massage. i'm fifi the maltese if i if i have to do oh, so God, it sounds like i would definitely need the, the absolutely uh, the maltese blueberry. and the bichon freeze they all go they all come in for their blue brew facials yeah and it's a very uh, tranquil it's actually good for the groomer as well so it's it's a very um uh meditative uh treatment you know both for groomer and for and for the dog and and it gets results you got a nice pristine white nice glowing fur on your face rather okay. than so i've know. had my hydro bath i've had my that's blueberry a, facial what, a, what's next then you would probably go into the social club um so the social club it's got various areas so we'll be able to identify the carers are all um animal behavior trained and first aid trained so they would in your day you would get an enrichment uh, time one-to-one away from the pack which would be any top-up training that or learn a new trick to show off when your owners come and pick them up and then you would have a physical examination uh, which is just a check that you know um, and like a massage so we would check all the all the limbs eyes ears mouth teeth um and just give them a once over just to make sure that they're all healthy and we haven't noticed any lumps or bumps anywhere um which is good we can feed that back to to their owners uh, and then you would get a bit of time to socialize find your friends and then we'll group you up with a maximum of four dogs and you would literally get into our custom built van go to the park and that is where you can you know it's still structured but that's where you can let loose and have some fun still get a little bit of training maybe a bit of fetch maybe a bit of you know come um but generally that's for you that's for you to do whatever you want you want to roll around in mud roll around in mud get loose get with it even after i just got my bath oh god yeah absolutely yeah we don't shy away from that it's your time you can do what you want you want to get that furry you know all the fur covered in mud we'll 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 clean that up trust me before they before they come pick you up no there's no there's no boundaries that they have to have release um then you probably come back if you are muddy and dirty then you would get a, a quick wash and go um and again you know um back into the social club to socialize you'd have your treats um so we use organic treats obviously with the the rec- you know um with the consent of your owner if you're allowed the treats and make sure that you're not got any allergies um and then you know you would basically relax until the end of the day probably go for a second walk quick second a quick second walk on your 24 hour stay and then you'd be back in you'd go to your little sleep hut you've got a raised bed you've got mood lighting um there's uh, chill out music playing so it's quite tranquil so we can dim the lights and there you would have your dinner uh tell me about the room the room now there are different options for lodging right so there are there's there's all the rooms uh all the rooms are pretty much the same apart from we have two we call them the penthouse suites and it's uh, just a, it's an adjoining door. So if you've got friends that have come to stay and they're happy with you to, you know, socialize and we can double up so they can double up or triple up on the, on, on those rooms. Um, and that's basically, that's where we put all your personal belongings. So we would put your, you know, your comfy blankie. Um, if you've got a little bit of separation anxiety um, or an old t-shirt of your owners. So you can, you've got the smell there so we can comfort you um with any of your toys and then you know your treats and you know treats um i'm i'm very very strict but if a dog does have a treat to chew on um somebody will sit there with you until you've finished because we don't want any accidents to happen uh it's 24 hour supervision so if you're in need in in the middle of the night and you know you need to go to the bathroom there's somebody there to take you out um and then again to bring you back and give you oodles and cuddles until you nod off again 
Wow, that does sound. And, and tell me a little bit about the food. I imagine that you probably have thought about that. So food is always, we don't like to change a dog's diet. It's, mm-hmm. it's not very good. So food would be supplied by your owner. And you okay. you would be given your food at your recommended you know uh, times. So um, we have other bits and pieces that we give uh, with regards to treats and maybe some interactive toys, you know, just to keep you occupied. Um, so yeah, so a lot going on, you know, as you know, as the day you know comes to a close, just to make sure that you're happy and your you know your energies are, are drained and you're ready to have a good night's sleep, ready for the next day. Well, that certainly sounds like uh, uh, an amazing experience for for our, for our <laughs> Fifi. That's that's pretty amazing. Um, what kind of feedback have you gotten since? Because you opened right when the oh, pandemic was. Well, we tried to open. Yeah, so we were expected to open in April, um, but then obviously lockdown happened, um, so it was delayed. And our launch, our well, our soft launch was in September, but then we closed in November. Then we reopened in December. Then we closed end of December, and now we've reopened now. Um, so we're looking forward to a, a. I think we got it right this time. So hopefully we'll have a, a longer run um, for the concept and, and and for these the lucky mutts that are members. And what? Tell me a little bit about the the, the financial side of it. What do, what does membership cost? Membership at the moment is is free. Um, hmm. But we do we do have to have uh, membership by all by all uh, dogs. So we have to have uh, their vaccination reports. Um, they come in for a consultation where we we find out a little bit about the dogs, about their fitness levels, about if they've got any allergies, if there's any you know um, if they've had any injuries in the past. And we also have details on the commands that they know and what words that we can use as carers. And also any top up training or any refinement training that they'd like to do whenever they come to visit, um, and that will so you sit. have a full dossier on, on all of your absolutely. Uh, yeah, your there's a lot dogs. of detail. Yeah, a lot of detail, but it also makes our care a little bit more bespoke for each individual dog. So every day when when a when an, a member arrives, we print their boarding card and it has all the details. So there's consistency. Boarding card, I guess. That's, that's it. That's a- Kind of a punny thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the boarding card is is produced and it has their notes. It has any allergies that they have, what time they need to eat, uh, what exercise they need to do for the day, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we have consistency because as we know, um, you know, Fifi, if she had no consistency, would be completely bonkers. So I think, right. you know, consistency is key to success. And to making a happy dog and you know urban mutt's vision is you know we make dogs happy um so to to do that consistency is key are most of your guests overnight guests or are they just there for the day well the majority well uh we haven't had a lot of uh holidays booked <laughs> as 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 humans so the dogs have pretty much been at home so predominantly now it's it's you know spa day we do a spa day bundle which is daycare plus treatments in the spa and a lot of daycare so people now starting to go back to work you know starting to you know maybe go back to the office a couple of times and also dealing with you know the lockdown puppies as we call them um, they need time away from their owners uh, which, which again, increases their confidence. So a lot of people dropping off for a couple of hours or for four hours just to gradually get them into the flow of things and, you know, get them used to going to mutt school um, and spending time with us. And, you know, as a run-up to when, you know, things open up even more and they're having to go back to a five-day-a-week, you know, nine-to-five job. So obviously uh, here in the States and I believe in the UK as well, uh, the, the the shelters saw a decrease in their population. A lot of people during the pandemic were adopting mm-hmm. dogs that might not otherwise have been adopted. What repercussions are you seeing any of, are you seeing any of, of that, uh, of those dogs coming to spend a little time with you? Oh, of course. Yeah, I've done a lot of stuff with, uh, with you know, rescue centers, you know, whether it was the Battersea Dogs and Cats Home, um, and we're affiliated, we're partners with an amazing charity, a, a lovely, beautiful friend of mine, Nikki Tibbles, who's 
Um, she's one, a renowned florist here in London, but she also uh, runs and um, founded uh, Wild at Heart Foundation, which is about spaying and neutering stray dogs around the world. So in very critical, you know, countries that have a you know a serious problem. But she also rehomes those dogs back in the UK to wonderful families. So I've done a lot of work with her rehabilitating, you know, dogs back into, you know, some form of normal loving environments that, you know, otherwise would have been, you know, completely lost because of their harsh upbringing. Um, and we see a lot of them, you know, and I've got clients of mine that, you know, turn up here and they're impeccably behaved and, you know, great members of the pack. So, you know, a huge success um, for these dogs and you know they've turned they've been lucky enough to to find good homes and good owners that want what's best for them they, they sound very lucky i know you've yeah. had some celebrity clients when you were doing the jogging absolutely uh, name some names oh name name that there's there's quite a few i can't talk about um okay. uh, for, for obvious reasons um right. but yeah i mean el mcpherson is one um, she's also become a very, very dear friend of mine. Um, so I looked after Bella and Moon. They used to run with me when they were here in the UK. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to take them out to Miami and settle them in Miami, um, get them trained, uh, you know, on the island to stay away from the bull sharks in the water. Um, <laughs> that is good. A good, a good training. That was good training. Yeah, it was an experience for me as well. Um, but yeah, I, you know, uh, Guy Ritchie, a wonderful, a wonderful client of mine and his, uh, wife, Jackie, um, and I've got, uh, Strictly Come Dancing. I don't know if you, you've obviously got your franchise of Strictly, uh, Come Dancing in the U S. Um, mm -hmm. but we've got ours here. So a lot of the dancers there, I've got the amazing Karen who she, uh, rescued three dogs from the Wild at Heart Foundation. Um, that I'm lucky enough to be their their carer and um, their first point of call when she's busy, you know, doing the shows and stuff. So um, the beautiful Betty Marley and Phoebe, um, Betty Boo as we call her, uh, was the first one. Then she adopted Marley, and then she adopted Phoebe, the uh, three-legged dog stray. She, you know, she was found with a broken leg that had healed, broken, so they had to amputate it. Um, but they're, again, beautiful dogs. You know, we've integrated them into an urban urban life, and they they're they're living life and living the dream. Do you see expanding beyond your current location in London? Absolutely. I mean, you know, that's always been on the cards. I think we're trying to set the bar um, by the way we do it, by the way you know our training, our policies and procedures need to be very very tight. When we're ready, we will. We've of course we've had a lot of interest. Um, but this is, you know, like I said, it's, it's a new, um, a new level of care and is a huge support for urbanites, um, because it is difficult, you know, we've all got busy, busy lives, um, but we're never going to stop people from buying dogs. So I think just as much as we look after the dogs, we need to look after our, our dogs owners as well and give them support and a tap into the industry and give them the plethora of experience that we have and knowledge we have of care pass it on because you can only do good by by doing that don't hold your cards close to your chest give it out there you know get them involved and you know increase their capabilities so then they can care for their dogs better and also support them when they're, you know, busy, you know, where's my dog going to go? It's a one-stop shop. It's going to come here. We've got everything. So let's bring this back to the beginning when we were talking a little bit about your restaurant days and, and how hard that was and, and how not, not just physically draining that was for you, mm. but there's the service ethic we were talking about, like, you know, how, how uh, Gordon Ramsay has changed the dining scene perhaps in, in, mm. in uh, London for the benefit. Do you see yourself perhaps in that same role as being a pivot point to changing how we care for dogs in an urban setting? Absolutely. I think that, you know, we want, when we say raise the bar, it's not about raising the bar and serving, you know, dog friendly champagne to our dogs. It's about, you know, we want people 
to come in here and, and, and notice the level of quality of both care and um, fit out environment that we've we've created to actually grow a community that demands it and speaks about it so then when other owners go to their daycares or their overnight facilities or their uh, dog walker they're saying well this place does this why are you not doing that you know because at the end of the day the most important thing for for me in in in, in this industry is to make sure that the dog is looked after in the best possible way and again i keep saying it happy healthy and set up to succeed in a very compromising environment Barry Caracostas, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me on. As the restrictions on travel begin to ease, I'm contemplating and looking forward to once again flying and hopefully returning to my annual business trip to Europe, which always includes some time in London. And when I'm there now, not only will I look forward to the great food, but I'll look forward to checking out Urban Mutts in person. I'm delighted that we heard from someone across the pond, as they say, because as you know, dog lovers live in places all over the world. In the Dog Podcast Network, we endeavor to bring you their stories. And we have a simple, powerful mission, just like Barry does, to help improve the quality of life for dogs and the people who love them. So we would love to hear your stories and suggestions for stories that we can cover here Please get in touch with us via our website at longleashshow.com, where you can check out our entire back catalog of in-depth conversations. There is a blue button on the bottom right of every page where you can leave us a voicemail message or send us a message via the contact form. And if you're not already getting the show in your podcast feed, please Follow us in your favorite podcast app on Apple Podcasts or Google or Spotify or whatever podcast app you love. We're also on YouTube. All the links are at longleashshow.com. And please do us a favor and tell a friend about the Long Leash and Dog Podcast Network because we have an ever-growing library of shows, especially for dog lovers. So you can check them out at our main website at dogpodcastnetwork.com. I'd like to thank Barry Karakostas again for joining us today. But most of all, I would like to thank you for pressing the play button and listening. I'm James Jacobson, and on behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. Aloha.